So last time uh, I introduced those constant acceleration equations. That is. Yeah. So it's like 11 units problems and four kinematics problems. So, yeah, the good news is for the first exam, you can be pretty clear what kind of questions is going to be on there. There's... Yeah. Yeah, you can get off on a good foot. You, have a, you can really focus on that stuff. So last time I introduced the constant acceleration equations, and we did a few problems with like balls rolling and a car stopping, um, but we haven't yet gotten to the main reason that we that it makes sense to focus on constant acceleration um, is. to write what I was planning to write there. Uh, we didn't get to the big topic, which is free fall and projectile motion. Okay. Um, so the most important reason that we do kinematics of, um, well, let's say for studying constant acceleration equations, is that they apply to free fall and projectile motion problems. And those are an important thing in physics. Um, I'm going to use those as synonyms. So, you know, you might think of free fall as just dropping straight down and projectile motion as something being launched out. But I'm going to just call it all free fall. So, even if you launch something out of a cannon, and once it's released, I'm, once it's gone from the cannon, I'm going to say it's in free fall. Um, the definition of one of these problems, so free fall or projectile motion, um, means that no, and I'll say significant, forces act on the object besides gravity. So gravity is acting, but nothing else. And that's, um, that's true if, like, if you shoot a cannonball out of a cannon, uh, there is some air resistance. It has to fight its way through the air, but um, a cannonball is heavy enough and dense enough that it isn't affected too much by air resistance. And so the only significant force acting on it as it flies through the air is gravity. You know, at one point there was a significant force acting, and that was when how the cannon shot it. But once it's alone in the air, it's just feeling gravity. Um, and so this brings up the first uh, common misconception of this class, and I want to really focus on these. Um, <coughs> so common misconception number one. And uh, when I bring these up, these are the things that People tend to, so most of, most of your uh, 
experience with balls and skateboards and all the things that you pick up and throw and drop and whatever over your life to this point has given you really good intuition about physics one principles. But there are some things where uh, it tends to be the case that uh, the things that you've grown to believe are true are actually not true. It's, um, and this is the first one of those. And these kind of things will be on quizzes for sure, okay? Every one of these will be on a quiz sometime. But people often think this. So it's often believed that um, object and a heavy object both in free fall Gravity makes the heavy object fall faster. Um, and you have a lot of experiences that make this seem like a reasonable uh, thing to believe. Uh, you know, if you take a bowling ball and a feather, ooh, yeah, bowling ball and a feather, and you drop them at the same time, the bowling ball is always going to hit the ground first. Okay. And that makes you think that gravity makes these things fall differently. But the key thing to understand is that it's not gravity that does that. The truth is that uh, gravity makes all objects fall the same way regardless of their weight. The only reason uh, you see some objects hit the ground before other objects, or let's say the only reason some objects fall faster than others, is that they are affected differently by air resistance. Okay, so it isn't gravity that makes a bowling ball fall faster than a feather. It's just that if you drop a feather, its fall is affected more by air resistance than the bowling ball is. And I'll talk about uh, what are the factors that go into air resistance. But what that's saying is um, if you removed all the air uh, from a, you know, from a tube or whatever, and you dropped a remove all the air, suck it all out with a powerful, uh, you know, pump. Um, and you drop a bowling ball and a feather at the same time, they'll fall exactly together, hit the ground at the exact same time, because gravity makes everything fall exactly the same 
it's the other stuff that affects them differently. Okay, that's that's a weird thing for people to wrap their heads around most of the time. The first time they're told that, um, and you know, the smartest people in the world for a long time had this same misconception. But I'm going to show you this awesome video uh, where yes. In space, well, uh, there. So where we go in space, everywhere we go in space, not maybe not everywhere, but most of the time, like when people are in space, like in orbit around a planet on a space station or something, they still they still feel gravity. They float because um, they and the space station are both in free fall around the Earth. That's sort of a like they're in. They float the same way, like if you were on a, well, I was going to say, if you were in an elevator that uh, the cable broke, oh, let's not say you, someone else, someone you don't like is in an elevator and the cable breaks and there was a camera inside the elevator, it would look like you were floating in there as you both fell together. And that's what, that's what astronauts are doing when they... Uh, they're they're not really it's they're not really in zero gravity. They just look like they're in zero gravity because they're falling. That's what yeah. When someone's in orbit, but I guess uh, once you get far enough out away from the Earth that you don't feel its gravity, then yeah, there's there's really no gravity. There's also no air resistance. Uh, there is in the spaceship, but outside in space, there's no air resistance. Um, But some, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, so I'm going to show you a video where um, they have this incredible facility, this huge facility. It must be super expensive to do this, but they use it for uh, for testing aircrafts. And I, I don't know what they do, what tests they're doing, but um, and this TV show goes in and. Uh, they suck all the air out of this gigantic building so it's truly a vacuum. And then mechanically, with, they use mechanical arms to drop a bowling ball and a feather, and you see exactly this happen. Because there's no air resistance on either of them, we're going to see the bowling ball and the feather fall together, see the feather smash against the ground and bounce up into the air. It's, it's really crazy looking. Um, And, oh, uh, they use the mechanical arms because if you suck all the air out of a room, it's very hard to breathe. And, uh, <laughs> and it would also make your head explode. And so those are the two main reasons that, so when you see the guy walking around in there talking, they have not sucked the air out yet. You know, we don't just have to, um, so this is one of the cases where we don't just have to put the information in your heads. We first have to remove some very strongly ingrained thoughts that are, that are actually wrong, you know. So I'm, that's something we're going to keep focusing on. If... Um, air resistance is negligible, <laughs> and the next thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about when you can expect air resistance to be more important and less important, but if air resistance is negligible, every object in free fall, and that includes things that are shot, you know, projectile motion too, accelerate, accelerate 
downward. at about 9.81 meters per second squared. And this acceleration uh, is what's referred to as G. So G is 9.81 meters per second squared. And uh, so when they say, um, like when in Top Gun, they're like, Goose, we're pulling seven Gs, or whatever. Um, that's seven times, they're accelerating at seven times that. That is, the, yes, that is on the surface of the Earth, roughly at sea level. Uh, although, um, so the real number at sea level is 9.8065 and on and on. Um, I think at the, at the top of Mount Everest, you know, that's as, as far as you can get from sea level. And um, based on the height, based on the altitude, it's like 9.803 or 4 or something. So it's basically the same. There are little fluctuations, bigger fluctuations than that, apparently, depending on the, the um, geological structures nearby. Um, that, so that's a really a, a bigger influence is just the local mass, you know, density of the of the ground. But it doesn't change very much if you're on Earth. Uh, on the moon, though, it's one sixth of that, I think, you know. Uh, so so, yeah, that's. That's just referring to the surface of the Earth. Yep. Okay. Um, so this is what we're going to use. Uh, when we talk about objects in free fall, uh, we're going to talk about accelerations downward at 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, The thing is, uh, in any real application, there is air. You know, there, none of the things we're trying to calculate are really like inside a vacuum chamber like that. Um, so, how do you know? When it's reasonable, to ignore the effects of air resistance and when that would give you terrible results. You know, when air resistance is really important to the object's motion. Um, well, here's an example. Uh, so when we talk about something in free fall, we're talking about something, if the only force is gravity, that means that the thing can't be touching anything, okay? And it means that the air resistance is negligible. So is it reasonable to say that um, any object that is not touching any other objects uh, accelerates downward at around 9.81 meters per second squared? No, that's not true. Think about a helicopter, you know, um, or an airplane. Uh, the only reason that those aren't accelerating downward at 9.81 meters per second squared is air resistance. But air resistance lets them climb up into the air if they want, you know. Same with parachutes and gliders and all this stuff. So there are definitely times where assuming that an object that's not touching anything else accelerates downwards at 9.81 is 
totally like beyond worthless as a as an approximation, you know. So we have to talk about uh, what are the cases where we can ignore air resistance. Um, So here are the things that determine air's effect on the object's motion. Um, the first thing is the mass of the object. Um, if you keep all the other things the same, um, so if all else is equal, um, an object with a larger mass is less affected by air resistance. Um, so for an example of this, um, think of um, dropping a pinball and a ping pong ball off the roof of a building. Um, they both have the same shape, roughly the same size. Uh, the only real major difference between them is a pinball is made out of steel or whatever kind of metal. A ping pong ball is hollow plastic. Um, but if you drop them off a building, the pinball would hit the ground a lot faster than the ping pong ball would, just because the mass is a lot higher. Okay. Um, so the pinball has greater mass and would hit the ground first. If you drop them inside that uh, vacuum chamber, they would hit at the same time. Actually, you know what would happen if you drop the ping pong ball inside that vacuum chamber? It would explode. It would explode because uh, ping pong balls are manufactured at atmospheric pressure. And so if you, there's like a struggle between the pressure of the atmosphere <laughs> pushing out and the pressure of the atmosphere pushing in and it's a tie. If you're at atmospheric pressure, if you take all that outer pressure away, that would be cool, actually. Yeah. I wonder. It's, making a good vacuum is hard. Like, we don't have any equipment that can do that. I'd love to do that, but I don't, I don't have a way to. I mean, I don't have a way to do it in a small. Yeah, like, that would be the way to do it was make a little clear box, but I mean, I don't have the equipment to do it. I mean, well, I don't know. So the way that works is it makes a, it's, it sucks in air by making a, relatively making a vacuum on the inside. And that sucks the air towards the vacuum because things at high pressure want to go to, think, to a low pressure. So it makes a low pressure in there, the vacuum, 
and the air sucks towards it. But I don't know how, when you say it makes a vacuum, I don't know like what fraction of atmospheric pressure yeah, it is. No, just, but yes, that's, so they are related. It is. No, that is the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on top of that, you put a class for this electron, mm -hmm. but it was all designed like this. Okay? Yeah. But basically, the air would get pumped out. Yeah. It would suck the glass down onto the upper thing, mm -hmm. and the explosion would be. That's funny. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I'll start thinking and planning. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Well, the so it makes air resistance uh, affect it less. But yes, you're. So here's what. So here's what's happening. What's they have the same shape, and so the force of air resistance is actually the same on the pinball and the ping pong ball. It's the same force of air resistance on both of them. The thing is, though, that to make the ping pong ball fall, remember I said gravity applies different forces based on the mass. So, so the weight, the force of gravity is actually bigger on the ping pong ball than on the, bigger on the pin ball than on the ping pong ball. And so gravity wins, the force of gravity wins out over that constant air resistance in the pin ball. Whereas with the ping pong ball, they're both small and so, the air resistance has an effect, you know? But that kind of stuff will make more sense when we start talking about what forces are and stuff. Um, okay, so that's the first thing, mass. Uh, the second thing is surface area. And it's not exactly surface area, but that's an okay way to think about it loosely. Um, so uh, if you have two things that have the same mass, uh, the thing that has a larger surface area is going to be, its motion is going to be affected more. Think about what you do when you put on a parachute. You're trying to make a huge surface area so the, so the air has a lot of space to catch hold of you. Um, so if all else is equal, an object with a larger surface area is more affected by the air. So I think the easiest way to think of that is imagine uh, imagine dropping um, a toy soldier with a parachute. along with, you know, a ball of the same mass. Um, the ball will hit the ground first. Um, because of the large surface area of the parachute,
And then the last thing, and this is the thing that matters the most. Um, and when I say the most, uh, I'll show you uh, the equation that puts all these pieces together, and you can sort of see why in lab. Um, but the third thing is the speed. Um, the faster something's going, the more its, res uh, its motion is affected by air resistance. So the faster something goes, the more its motion is affected by air resistance. Um, and uh, This, you know, like I just said, this is the one that has the biggest effect. Um, and the thing that I think of with this, I don't know, I can link some videos of this so you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Sorry, say it again. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's no such thing as terminal velocity in a vacuum. Because terminal velocity means that the force of gravity pulling something down is exactly equal to the force of air resistance pushing up. And so in air, everything eventually gets to a terminal velocity because as the thing gets faster and faster, the air resistance force keeps increasing. The gravity force stays constant. And so in air, eventually, no matter what you're talking about, it has a terminal velocity. In a vacuum, there's no air resistance force, so the idea doesn't even, it's not possible, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Speed of light. I have never heard of air resistance, uh, thought of air resistance for the speed of light, but. Oh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, you couldn't go faster than the speed of light. What? Yeah. But I was thinking, like, um, I know that it gets harder to go towards the speed of light because it takes more energy and faster. Mm -hmm. But this is because it's impacting the air resistance more because the air in space is going to be part of the light. But um, assuming you were in a vacuum, like a complete vacuum, yeah. nothing in there, it would be possible. No, because it's not air that does that. It's it's weird uh, theory of relativity oh. effects. So even in space, that's true. Um, oh. That yeah, it's it's related to EMC squared somehow, but uh, that's about the limit of my knowledge on it. But it doesn't have to do with air. It's true in space. Okay, so think of this. Okay, you're gonna have to take my word for this if you don't uh, if you don't like bicycle racing, but I do. So I'm gonna describe. Okay, so um, in like the Tour de France, um, you know, they race 2,000 miles over three weeks, uh, 100 mile, whatever, plus a day for three weeks. And through all these races, uh, there isn't, there aren't very many times where the people who are going to win have a chance to break away from the other people. There's only a, a handful of races where they can. And the reason for that is that um, if, if you try to jump out in front, you're, you have all the air resistance on you, and the people behind you just tuck in, ride behind your wheel, and they have to do so much less work that even the worst pro cyclist could easily ride behind the best pro cyclist, you know. But two of the places, well, places where you have the best chance to make up time are in the time trials. And in the time trials, 
you can't tuck behind someone. You just take off one by one and they time you how fast you can ride 25 miles or whatever. Okay? So you got that. A time trial is just like you going out by yourself and riding as fast as you can, and then they compare your times at the end. And there are two times that you can do time trials. Uh, most of the time trials are on flat roads. And Um, so flat time trials versus the other kinds are time trials where you have to race up a, a mountain in the Alps. And here's what their suits look like for these time trials. Um, on the ones that are on the flat, let's see. So they look sort of like... Okay, they're wearing like, oh, this is going to be good, I can tell already. <laughs> oh, he has a tail. Okay, so now how does this all work? So there's a, there's a wheel here, a wheel here. Um, do it. <laughs> um, okay, so something like that. And the thing is, okay, uh, they're wearing like sort of rubberized spandex suits. Um, they're wearing these helmets that look like the cross sections of airplane wings. They're bent all the way over so that they're um, so that the area that's facing the wind is as small as possible, and they go through uh, such minute precautions that even you know the cables that connect your brakes and your shifters to the the in the front to the brakes and the derailers in the back, they have those going through the tubes of the bike so that. They won't, so that these riders won't have to deal with the extra air resistance of a cable touching the wind, you know? So that's how much air resistance is the only thing they care about. Like, how much does it, like, if you look at these guys, how much does it look like their comfort or, like, how their suits are all the way zipped up? Obviously, they could, they could put a lot more force into the pedals if they were allowed to wear cooler stuff and, you know, wear a more comfortable helmet and stuff. But that stuff is, um, so here, air resistance is almost the only thing they care about in these races. Uh, you're not allowed to do that. That's why, uh, otherwise they would. Yes, yes. Actually, apparently they would they would ride those sort of funny looking recumbent bikes for apparently way more aerodynamic than but their rules and so they're just doing as much of this stuff as they can within the rules. Yep. Oh yeah, I have seen that. Everyone else is pedaling as hard as they can, and he it is that's crazy. Um, okay, well here's what a mountain time trial outfit looks like. So. Um, When you see these guys riding mountain time trials, they're wearing just their regular bike helmets. They're uh, wearing just regular short sleeve shirts and shorts. Um, they don't even bother to have their um, they don't even bother to have their hands in the lower parts of their Okay, they don't even bother to put their hands in the lower parts of their handlebars to get more aerodynamic. They look like they're basically like they look like 50 guys you see anytime you get onto the Greenway in Minneapolis, you know? So, in these, air resistance...
isn't a concern. Everything that they're doing is just based on how much force they can apply to the pedals, how cool they can stay, that kind of stuff. And so why is that? I mean, the idea is the same. The reason is that if they're riding on the flat, they can go about 40 miles per hour. And if they're riding up a mountain, they can go about 15 miles an hour. And the difference between 40 miles an hour and 15 miles an hour is enough of a difference to make this the best way to ride fast if you're going 15 miles an hour and to try to turn yourself into like a, you know, like a bullet or whatever to try to ride fast on the flat. Sort of cool. If... Um, An object can be treated as in free fall. And free fall and projectile motion mean the same thing. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, when can you treat an object as if it's in free fall, uh, that means it's not touching any other objects. And the effect of air resistance is small. Then um, the object accelerates downwards at 9.81 meters per second squared. So it accelerates down with an acceleration of lowercase g, which is 9.81. Eight one meters per second squared. Okay, so in free fall problems, uh, you start already knowing the acceleration. So two facts that will be useful in free fall problems. First one, when an object is dropped, um, instant gets released. It has the same velocity as what it's dropped from. It's different if it says something is launched or thrown. Uh, then, you know, like if you launch or throw something from a moving vehicle, it's going to have, at the instant it gets launched, released, it's going to have a different velocity than the vehicle. But if it's just dropped, if all you're doing is just letting go of it, um, then its initial velocity at that instant it's released will be whatever it's dropped from. Yep. And even if, like, even if, now this is a little hard to imagine. But think of like a tissue paper, a feather or something, and you're going 80 miles per hour in your car, a balloon, okay? And you let go of it. At the instant you let go of it, that balloon's going forward at 80 miles an hour. 
Well, yeah, but it just slows down really, really fast. Okay. But yes, whatever you let go of has that velocity of what you let go of it from. Yep. But you throw it straight down. Well, um, then you're going to have to calculate how quickly it was thrown or, it, or it's given. Um, and, you know, really you can think the way that it's the same is if you think of uh, it being on a vehicle, it's your arm and you're letting go of it at the end of your arm moving, then it's released with the same velocity that your hand has at the instant you let go of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so we can't do it yet in one dimensional motion, but we'll be able to do it in two dimensional motion. Yep. Uh, so, like for example, uh, you know, bridge, building, car, elevator, whatever. Um, these are things that will come up in problems. And when you let go of the thing, it, at that instant, its velocity is whatever the thing's velocity was, the vehicle's velocity was. The second fact that's going to come in handy is if an object starts out moving up, it reaches its highest point and velocity is equal to zero. So um, in any problems where it asks like how high something is at its highest point or whatever, the way you're going to find that is by setting its velocity equal to zero and then solving for um, solving for related variables. So let's do one like that. 